pediatric speech language pathologist and welcome to my podcast number 446 ethics for the slp a review of ash's code of ethics brought to you by my website teach me to talk where we're the largest online provider of asha approved continuing education courses for early interventionists now currently in july of 2022 we have over 75 courses available in our five dollar ceu program so i hope you'll check that out and the information about that is below. Now, if you're new to my CEU courses, you can find the link for purchasing CE credit for only $5 in the post below. And with CE purchase, you'll get a copy of the handout of the show like this. So if you have your handout already, please feel free to follow along. If you haven't purchased credit, that's okay. You can watch the course first and then go back and purchase your credit. Now, in this ethics course, we're going to review ASHA's Code of Ethics for Speech Language Pathologists. Now, this is a required <laughs> CEU course, as you know. Uh, for certification and licensure and lots of speech language pathologists have asked us to do this at Teach Me to Talk so we are going to do it. Now why is ethics important? Reviewing ethics is important because throughout our careers we always face these situations whether it's within our organizations with other professionals or other team members or even with the families and clients that we serve that become entangled or sticky or icky and give us just that pit in the bottom of our stomachs that make us wonder, is somebody asking me to do something that's not right? Why am I feeling like this? And so we have to always think about how ethics applies to our everyday practice. So let's review some super common examples of ethical dilemmas that perhaps you are facing right now. What about responding to a family member who asks you to do something that's not in the best interest of their own child? What about dealing with suspected abuse? How about responding to a colleague who's behaving questionably or unprofessionally? Or how about addressing state, local, or even uh, national program directives to do something that are not developmentally appropriate or may be potentially harmful to children? What do you do in these situations? So we're gonna be thinking through these kinds of things in our course today, beginning with this really, really important question. Do you have a process for resolving the professional dilemmas that will always come up within your organization, with colleagues or with the families you serve? And if you are a speech pathologist, yes, you do. <laughs> you do have a process for resolving those kinds of things. And it's called the ASHA Code of Ethics. Now, if you are happening to watch this and you're not an SLP, you probably also have a code of ethics, whether you are an early interventionist, an OT or a PT, and certainly state licensure boards also have, uh, typically have a code of uh, ethics of their own. So all of us, no matter what field we're in, in early intervention and in pediatric therapy uh, have this legally binding and uh, ethically binding set of rules or guidelines to follow. And we have to remember when we're looking at the code of ethics, sometimes what's permitted legally isn't always ethical. And that's the conflict that we feel. Our initial reaction may tell us that something is illegal because again, that's pretty black and white and it's plain wrong. So we recognize that. But sometimes doing what's right is even harder than, and than not knowing or not doing what we know is wrong. So it's sometimes more difficult for us to determine. And so we're going to end this course contrast ethical behavior with legal behavior. So let's begin, and again, you can follow along on your handout. What is a code of ethics and why is it needed? So a code of ethics is a statement of standards of behavior agreed upon by the members of a profession. It establishes the moral obligations that we're expected to honor as we serve the populations that we serve, and whether that's our own caseload or uh, within our professional responsibilities uh, to society at large. Now, the code of ethics is established, uh, it establishes the foundation for the profession's shared values and outlines what the group believes to be right, to be good, and to be fair professional behavior. So there are always five important functions of the code of ethics. And again, this is across the board. This isn't just relevant for speech language pathologists for ASHA's code of ethics. Overall, our system code of ethics, uh, number one, sets the standard for ethical awareness and judgment 
judgment. And these are things that we think about as we are uh, involved in these uh, dilemmas or these conflicts. It also establishes the standard of behavior for professional group. And again, think about rules with this. It might also be something like best practice for uh, various conflicts that we might encounter. Thirdly, it provides guidance in decision making. So when you're not sure what to do, and again, we've talked about some of those big ones at the beginning, but we're gonna walk through some of those really specific things that we all face throughout this course and certainly in uh, the next ethics course where we look at lots of different case studies. And also the fourth important function, <clears throat> it can give you moral courage to do what's right when you know that you have the document behind you and your organizations, again, that, that, that uh, decision-making process laid out for you. So it gives you the courage, again, to do what's right uh, when other people may be asking you or expecting you to do things that you're uncomfortable with. And again, it also offers a shared identity. So let's look specifically at what Ash's Code of Ethics says that it reflects. And again, this is specific to us as SLPs. It's what we value as professionals. And again, it establishes the expectation for our scientific as well as our clinical practice. And it's based on principles of duty, accountability, fairness, and responsibility. So the ASHA Code of Ethics is intended to ensure the welfare of the consumer, so the clients and the families that we serve, and again to protect our own reputations and integrity uh, as we uh, guard our profession with our professional behavior. So again, let's compare like we said we were going to do, and this is one of your, uh, uh, your uh, benchmarks that you want to meet for this course, your learning objectives. So we're going to compare ethical behavior versus legal behavior, and you've got a chart on your handout, and we're going to put it here on the screen so that we can compare those differences. So first, let's just kind of compare and contrast and talk about these as we move down the list. So let's look at ethical behavior versus legal behavior. So ethical behaviors are a set of principles to guide our choices. So usually ethical behaviors, and with the code of ethics, it's written with the language of what I can do, what I'm supposed to do, what I should do. When we look at legal behavior, that sets limits for behavior and conduct based on what we can't do. So again, we're kind of looking at it from a positive perspective with the code of ethics versus the legal perspective with the laws that are set forth there. And again, as a limit for what you really can't do. Next, ethical behaviors are geared toward achieving responsible conduct versus legal behaviors geared toward preventing unlawful acts. So again, we've got that contract there, uh, contrast there between the positive and the negative, what's responsible here versus what's illegal. We absolutely cannot do it. Uh, also with ethical uh, behaviors, we're gonna treat ethics as best practice for making decisions to uh, benefit those that we serve, whereas legal behavior really emphasizes the rules and it uses monitoring and penalties for enforcement. Ethical behaviors are always rooted in values and again that might be morality or spirituality and legal behavior is uh, rooted in that deterrence theory meaning that we're going to prevent people from doing bad things by manipulating the cost of misconduct so can we make the penalty for this so terrible that that alone would keep you from crossing that line and again, Again, ethics would be what we should do. Legal behavior is going to be what we must do. And again, to avoid this penalty. When we consider legal behavior versus ethical behavior, we actually have four ways to classify professional action. So let's take a look at these now, and they're going to be up on your screen. It's uh, from a researcher named Shea Ben. We can have legal but ethical behavior, or legal and ethical, illegal but still ethical, legal but unethical and unethical and illegal. All right, so legal and ethical. Let's take a look at all four of these categories. So let's start with legal and ethical. So that's where we're going to spend most of our time. So what are some examples of things that you do every day that are legal and ethical? And again, we hope that all of our time is spent here, but that would be adhering to a child's IFSP or IEP, so their plan of care. It would be appropriate documentation. So when you're doing your visits, not only that you're there and the, the accountability with all that with your billing practices, but certainly even documenting the results. So ethically, they're looking at how much progress the child is really making and, and measuring that objectively so that you can show 
that need for skilled services. Certainly another ethical behavior would be providing appropriate supervision to any students or uh, paraprofessionals or other kinds of staff members that you'll be supervising and we will talk a lot about this as we read through the Code of Ethics. And then following all the guidelines that have been provided for us to follow. So again, it's it's when you are following the rules and you were doing everything and, and nothing is questionable there, that's your legal and ethical behavior. Let's look at illegal but ethical. Now if you're like me, you're probably thinking, how can that be? What, what would be an example of illegal but ethical? And I bet that you do this too, but you don't think about it in this way. This is any time that we deviate from what the courts would determine is appropriate when we're serving a child and his or her family. And although it may be ethical because it benefits the client and it's in the best interest of that child or that family, uh, it, it might still be not exactly written into the plan of care. So this would be like if you overstay or see a child for more minutes than uh, his IFSP or IEP would say. And so again, lots of us do that, right? And so that's an illegal uh, behavior because the IFSP and the IEP are really a contract between uh, the, the organization and the family with the services that we are going to provide. And so when we go beyond that, we really are in that uh, illegal category. But again, is it right for the kid? Absolutely. <laughs> and that's why we're usually choosing to do that. So that that's an example that I wanted you to think about. Let's talk about something that might be legal, but unethical. And so this would be something that the court would uphold as legal, but it's not in the best interest of the client. So this would be something like, and again, some of you may be in this situation where you're designing uh, and maybe your program is doing this or your organization is doing this but you're designing a plan for less than you know that that child needs because of something like staffing or scheduling restrictions or program restrictions and so let's say let's just use an example that that again is so common to us that we might have a child with, uh, who's just gotten evaluated and gotten an autism diagnosis and he's a level three and so we need sub very substantial support but the only speech that he can get would be two times a month because there's not another speech language pathologist who, I mean, there's no one to see him. And so again, that's a legal situation that we're in because we have to write the plan that way, but it's certainly not what that child needs and it's certainly not in his best interest. So that would be an example of that. Now let's look at unethical and illegal and we all know what these things are. This would be fraudulent billing or uh, inadequate supervision, falsifying documentation, anything that we all just want to stay away from, you know, with a 10 foot pole. And so you want to be really, really careful about that. And so we certainly all know things when we look back at those four categories. We understand when we're legal and ethical and we understand when we're unethical and illegal, but sometimes those second and third ones in the middle uh, may be a little trickier for us to determine. So again, as we said at the beginning, we do have a system that will protect us and help us in these situations. And this is called the Code of Ethics. And it's not to tie your hands or rule with an iron fist, but it's really, really to protect you as a professional. So let's look at this document and let, we have to know what's there and how to find it before we can really, really use it. So let's just take a look at this. Now, if you have purchased CE credit for this course already, you'll find a link to the Code of Ethics there if you want to print this out for yourself. It's uh, a 10 or an 11 page document, but there are four primary sections and they're all designed around principles. But the rules that pertain to how you as the professional interact and all these other facets of your professional life. So principle number one contains rules that pertain to responsibility to patients and clients. So your first and foremost responsibility to those children and families that you serve. Principle number two are rules that pertain uh, and responsibility to self. So how are you protected as a professional in these various kinds of situations that you'll find yourself in? Principle number three, or section number three, the rules pertain to responsibility to the public. So again, kind of consumership at large there, or how we represent SLPs. And you might think that uh, you know, just in your everyday practice that you that's not really something that you encounter, but it certainly is because all the families that we meet, you know, you're you're probably not known by your name for a long time. You're just that speech language pathologist or that speech therapist or whatever. And again, you're representing our profession when you do that. And so certainly I think about somebody like in my situation who has a has a website or a blog or a, a, a 
some, somehow some kind of beyond you know a caseload there this is really really important these kinds of rules are important for that uh, that kind of uh, role too. Principle number four are rules that pertain uh, with responsibility to the profession. So again, you with how you interact uh, professionally within ASHA, within uh, the American Speech Language and Hearing Association. All right, so typically within each of those four principles, there are about 10 to 15 rules. Each one is really, really specific and it addresses an area within that principle. Uh, it, and again, when you know, when you understand what's here, when you read, when you actually read it through one time, it will give you some backbone and some support in those situations that you need it. And so again, when you're looking at this, if you think, I have a question about responsibility to my profession, so SLPs in general, okay, you would know that's in principle four, that's where I need to look. Or this one is about me and my professional conduct, that would be principle number two. And so again, that helps you locate what you need uh, within the code of ethics. Now, as we said, we're going to walk through this entire code of ethics. We're supposed to read these every year when we sign uh, our, and pay our ASHA dues, or, and certainly the years that we're doing our uh, cert, uh, certification maintenance intervals when we're signing that paperwork there that we've actually read the Code of Ethics. So we're going to uh, do this now. Feel free to follow along, and we're going to show you on the screen uh, with graphics the page that we're on, and so we're going to quickly summarize these rules, and we'll talk about a few of those ethical challenges as we go. So let's start with principle number one, and remember these were rules pertaining to how we serve our clients, and, uh, and again that would be not just the child, but certainly the child's family. So the principle reads, individuals shall honor their responsibility to hold paramount the welfare of persons they serve professionally or who are participants in research and scholarly activities and that they shall treat animals involved in research in a humane manner. All right, so the first ones here in section one or principle one speak to our effectiveness. So under, uh, well, like we said before, this is organized uh, in these sections So they have Roman numerals. So we have all the letters under here. So the first one here, the first section is individuals shall provide all clinical services and scientific activities competently. And then let's talk about B here. Individuals shall use every resource, including referral and or interprofessional collaboration when appropriate to ensure that quality service is provided. So have you thought about that before? The Code of Ethics really says that you as an SLP will refer out <laughs> as often as you should. So what about that when it, you know that a child really needs OT? He needs uh, maybe uh, someone to look at his sensory system and what his parents are doing with him, with him sensory-wise that would make it easier for this child to participate in his everyday routines, whether that's at home with sleep problems or regulation problems in general, or certainly how he participates at school. We know in our heart of hearts that a kid needs OT, and again, we don't, we don't really refer for whatever reason. Our code of ethics tells us, yeah, make those referrals. Go ahead and do everything that you can do to, again, provide uh, the most effective or most competent level of service that you can um, with uh, whatever you're dealing with professionally. And so again, your code of ethics also tells you there, we are going to have interprofessional collaboration. So anytime that you need another therapist, you know, do you, do you do that? Do you pursue those opportunities or do you just try to wing it? And so again, these are ethical things that we all need to think about. Uh, the next uh, guideline here under this section deals with discrimination. So individuals shall not discriminate in the delivery of professional services or in the conduct of research and scholarly activities. And again, all the standard uh, discrimination wording here on the basis of race, ethnicity, sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, religion, national origin, disability, culture, language, or dialect. And so we certainly are familiar with that. The next ones have to do with support with uh, support personnel or students and how we supervise them and the things that we delegate to them. And so the first one under this section, individuals shall not represent the credentials of aides, assistants, technicians, support personnel, students, research interns, clinical fellows, or any others under your supervision. And they shall, here's the big one, inform those that they serve professionally of the name, the role, and the professional credentials of persons providing services. So this is so, so important when you're supervising paraprofessionals or aides or students, the families that we're serving, we have to tell uh, the people that help us do our jobs who our support people are and their credentials. And lots of times parents get confused about that. 
And so we want to make sure that they understand when it's when we're working with a student, when we're supervising a student, uh, what what that 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 person is still in school or that the rehab aid that we're not. Uh, the, that the family understands that they're the rehab aid and not the physical therapist working with the family. And so again, you have to kind of think about those things. The next ones all deal with how to provide supervision. And again, these provide with pair, uh, these begin with pair professionals. So th this is how the wording reads. Individuals who hold the certificate of clinical competence may delegate tasks related to the provision of clinical services to aides, assistants, technicians, support personnel, or any other persons own only if those persons are adequately prepared and are appropriately supervised. And then it goes on to say, the responsibility for the, for the welfare of those being served remains with the certified individual. And so when we're asking a student or we, we're asking an aide to do something that they haven't really been taught how to do, that's something that uh, uh, could get us in a lot of trouble ethically. And so we have to be sure that we are training our support folks and again, not giving them anything to do that they, that's beyond their own scope of practice. All right, uh, the next section again uh, continues with this is that we shall not delegate tasks that require the unique skills, knowledge, judgment, or credentials that are within the scope of, of our profession to any of our other support personnel. So for example, your uh, SLP assistant cannot do assessments, even if she's wonderful, <laughs> even if her uh, objectivity is there and you think, oh my goodness, and certainly you're not gonna do that, but there, a, a lot of times when we're looking at these ethical dilemmas, it's not that we wanna do something that's wrong, sometimes it's that our supervisors don't really understand uh, what maybe even the law is, or what, again, scope of practice would be for uh, someone who is not a licensed therapist. And so you really, again, have to stick to the code of ethics there to protect yourself professionally so that you, uh, again, aren't doing anything that, that would violate your ethical responsibility. And so our counterparts who work with adults would always say, don't ever let a non-therapist do skilled services. And that's how you keep yourself out of trouble there. All right, so let's go on and move on and talk about the students. And that would be grad students and undergrad students that we supervise. And so individuals who hold the certificate of clinical competence may delegate to students tasks related to the provision of uh, clinical services that require the unique skills, knowledge, judgment that are within the scope of practice of their profession only if those students are adequately prepared and are appropriately supervised. And so again, we took the same wording that we did with our support uh, personnel there and uh, took that same wording and applied that to students. And so again, the responsibility for the welfare of any uh, client or family that you would serve that your student sees really still remains with you. And so students, again, can do anything that we can do as professionals, but only if they're prepared and adequately supervised. And so let's talk about a real life scenario here. Let's say that you're sick. Let's say that you are very sick <laughs> suddenly, and but you know you're gonna be out for several days. Let's say that your boss is an educator or maybe a nurse or a, another kind of uh, administrative professional but not a therapist. So you're calling in sick and your boss says, oh, you've got a student this semester and, and maybe she's just been with you for two weeks and your, your boss just says, oh, let the student cover your caseload. But you know that your student is not prepared for so many of the kids in the family that you see and you also know that you've got some avowals booked and there's no on-site supervision available you know that she's only been with you a couple of weeks there's no way that she's ready and so again this kind of situation at the beginning of the semester might look a lot different with a student than it would at the end of the semester and so you've really really got to think about those things and it's not really, remember what we said, the, the responsibility lies with the professional person, with the certified individual, but it's not really uh, fear to that student either to kind of throw her to the wolves in that kind of situation. And so we do have to be careful and use our code of ethics, again, to protect all of us in that situation. Now, the next several guidelines are about informed consent. And so we have to obtain informed consent from the persons that we serve about the nature and the possible risks and effects of services provided. The technology employed and the products dispensed. And so he, here's a, the big one in this guideline. This obligation also includes informing persons served 
<clears throat> about the possible effects of not engaging in treatment or not following the clinical recommendations. And then it goes on to say, if diminished decision-making ability of persons served is suspected, individuals should seek appropriate authorization for services, such as authorization from a spouse, another family member, or legally authorized or appointed representative. And so, what happens when you're, when, on your case, like when families refuse services? Do you talk with them about the potential uh, negative effects? And so lots of us would say, no, that's going to be none of my business. They've made that decision. They can make choices for their children. Absolutely. And I would never argue with that. However, sometimes I don't think parents understand the risk of not getting therapy. And so certainly that's something that we need to communicate. And so we have to tell pa uh, parents about possible effects. You know, if we, uh, suspect that a child has apraxia, we know that speech therapist is the only evidence-based practice recommended when a kid has apraxia. And so we have to, again, uh, talk with that and uh, talk about that with families and balance that with their own concerns and their own autonomy, which we'll talk about later, which is another really important concept when we're looking at ethical behavior. What if a, a parent's decision-making uh, skills are questionable. Have you had that happen before? So what did the Code of Ethics say? It says that we're going to go to the next responsible person in the family. And I had a therapist talk with me about this a couple of weeks ago when she said, I really don't think mom understands that that she was even there for her child to get an autism evaluation. I don't think that she really understood uh, what was going on through that assessment. You know, and I asked the therapist, was anybody there? You know, how, how did mom get there? And so we kind of talked uh, through that, you know, can she drive, you know, those kinds of things. And really, uh, we, we have to think about those things and we have to make sure that ethically that we're, ex we're explaining things. And when we know that a family member is not able to really process what we're talking about, we do have that responsibility uh, to go to the next person. All right, the next sections deal with accurate representations or telling the truth. <laughs> and so individuals shall enroll and include persons as participants in research or teaching demonstrations only if participation is voluntary without coercion and with informed cons consent. And then individuals shall accurately represent the intended purpose of a service product or research endeavor and shall abide by the established guidelines for uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the, the last couple in this section deal with reasonable expectation of benefit. And so individuals who hold the, your C's, the Certificate of Clinical Competence, shall evaluate the effectiveness as of the services provided, technology employed, and products dispensed, and they shall provide services or dispense products only when benefit can be reasonably expected. Now, sometimes we do question this when we are working with severely impacted kids, and we say, can I really, really, really expect progress here? Now, me, my own uh, personal opinion, my own ethical and moral opinion here is we can always work with a child. We can always help that child improve. We can always look for that next little step, but you've got to get your goals right here. Now, that's not what this show is about. That's usually what most of my podcasts are about with working with toddlers and preschoolers and making sure that we meet them where they are and that we understand where they are developmentally and that we use the right strategies. You know, so many times with our little guys, we work at levels way up here. We start way up here with talking when they don't really understand language or when there's no social engagement or when there's a big cognitive gap that's really, really uh, impacting their abil ability to learn language. And so we have to think about that. And with reasonable expectation of benefit, sometimes I've heard therapists use this and say, I don't know why I'm doing all this therapy. I don't know that this kid's ever going to get better. And if that's you, I, I wish I could just, you know, reach through the screen right now and say, there's always something you can work on. You've just got to get your goals right. And so again, if you need help with that, this isn't the show for that. But I hope that you'll check out my other uh, courses because that, that's certainly something that we focus on at Teach Me To Talk. All right. So the next uh, here, here we go. Let's continue with this that we were talking about. The next one is individuals may make a reasonable statement of prognosis, but they shall not guarantee directly or by implication the results of any treatment or procedure. And you certainly know that. Certainly sometimes we want to tell parents, I know your child is going to talk. I know he's going to talk. I know he's going to talk. And then we sit there six months later or 12 months later and he's still not talking. So be sure that you're really, really 
careful with that kind of promise even if you're thinking about a statement of prognosis for a family be super super careful about that all right uh, the next one is individuals shall hold individuals who hold the certificate of clinical competence shall use independent and evidence-based clinical judgment keeping paramount the best interest of those being served. And so what is that really saying to you? It's saying, don't cave in <laughs> to administrators or other people who are telling you the level of service that you should recommend for a child or, or how you should really provide those services because you're supposed to be able to use independent and evidence-based clinical judgment. And the next one is that we, uh, it has to really deal with uh, telepractice. So this became a really big deal during the pandemic. So so individuals who hold the certificate of clinical competence shall not provide clinical services solely by correspondence. So that would mean just you know email contact or uh, whatever you would think about for correspondence, but may provide services via telepractice consistent with professional standards and state and federal regulations. So you've got to know your rules. They're different by state, and that's all I want to talk about with that. All right, the next section deals with record keeping. So you have to protect the confidentiality and security of records. You can allow access to those records only when it's necessary to protect the welfare of the person or the community, when it's legally authorized or it's otherwise required required by law and I think we're well aware of HIPAA and if you were like me and were practicing when HIPAA became new and we were all just up in arms all the time about keeping our records private uh, certainly some of that has that that fear has lessened around that but we need to always uh, keep that in mind with who we can release records to and who we can't. Guideline P in this section has to do with protecting confidentiality of any professional or personal information about any person that we would serve professionally or who might be involved in research or scholarly activities with us. And we can only disclose that personal information when we are legally authorized or when we have a release to do so. Uh, and we also know with record keeping that we have to keep timely records and accurate documentation and accurately bill for the services that we provided uh, and those uh, kinds of things. Now, there's also in this section an obligation for reporting practitioners who may be harmful to other people. And so guideline R here talks about substance abuse, addiction, or other health-related conditions where we have practitioners who are impaired and who should seek professional assistance and when appropriate withdraw from the affected areas of practice. Uh, the next one talks about what do you do when you have a colleague that you know who should not be practicing? And so again, our code of ethics, the responsibility there is to report this information to the appropriate authority. First start internally if a mechanism exists and otherwise you go external for that. And the uh, other, uh, the next guideline in this section is reasonable notice and referrals. And this uh, really, hinders therapists who practice in areas where there aren't a lot of therapists. So let's look at this one. Individuals shall provide reasonable notice and information about alternatives for obtaining care in the event that they can no longer provide professional services. So I hear this often in emails from parents that the therapist quit with no notice. Now ASHA's website also lists this as one of the ethical inquiries that they've had. And so certainly employers lots of times will want to use this part of our code of ethics and say, you know, you can't quit no notice here because we've got to have time to get your families notified that you're not going to be seeing them and then time to get coverage so that that child can continue to receive services. So those were all principle number one and how we, our responsibilities and how we deal with the clients, whether they be children or families that we serve. So let's move on to number two. This is how we conduct ourselves professionally so individuals shall honor their responsibility to achieve and maintain the highest level of professional competence and performance. And so section A here deals with staying within your professional practice and competence, considering what we know with our certification status, our education, training, and experience. So basically this is saying stay in your own lane. <laughs> don't do things that you don't know how to do. So what do you do? And I remember back to being a young therapist and one of my first jobs, I think it actually was my first job, I think I was still in my clinical fellowship year, when uh, I got lots of hard feeding babies and I had done feeding with adults and I had done lots of language, you know, speech language things with babies, but I had not done a ton of feeding with these medically fragile babies. 
And guess what? I was it. It was me or nothing. And so in that situation, when you can't find somebody else, what do you do? Do you not take the referral? Do you not serve the family? No, <laughs> you get yourself <laughs> additional training and additional uh, additional uh, people to consult with so that they can pour information into you and then you can use that to serve other families. But at the same time, had there been somebody else to refer to, had there been another person who had a lot more experience than me or even a little bit more experience than me at that point, I would have gladly referred those children on. So certainly this is something that we had have to think about. All right, um, the next section is a big one. It has to deal with can you practice without your C's and what does that really, really mean? Does that mean that you have to pay your ASHA dues every single year or you no longer have your C's? There's so many questions about this and so let's just read it. Members who do not hold the certificate of clinical competence may not engage in the provision of clinical services. All right, that is your initial certificate of clinical competence. That means what you got after you did your nine months of your clinical fellowship year um, you know and again that's based on a school year there however let's let's keep reading individuals who are in the certification application process may engage in the provision of clinical services consistent with current local uh, and state laws and regulations and, uh, within ASHA certification requirements. All right, so really this deals with certification with membership to ASHA and certification without membership to ASHA. And so remember when we maintain our certification, we're saying we're doing our continuing education hours. We're staying current. We, we are within our scope of practice here. And again, we're maintaining that uh, credibility and integrity because we are still adhering to all these things that we sign that we're doing when we pay our ASHA dues and again maintain our certification there. And remember certification is different from ASHA membership and I think that's where a lot of therapists get really really confused with that. And that was one of the ethical dilemmas that uh, was listed on ASHA's website that people ask about that other professionals report and say, I know this person is not a member of ASHA, but she's still signing CCC. Can she do that? And so uh, certainly that's something that comes up and that uh, you may have questions about from time to time. All right, the next guideline is talking about research and research shall comply with all institutional state and federal regulations and address and uh, with any aspect of research including those that involve human participants and animals and then the next one deals with directly those continuing education experiences that we just talked about individuals shall enhance and refine their professional competence and expertise through engagement in lifelong learning applicable to their professional activities and skills that's exactly what you're doing here today <laughs> uh, let's move on and talk about supervision here and again this is comparable to what we read in principle one when we were talking about supervision and what we were dealing with with uh, the clients that we serve and their families so same kind of thing but it's talking about what our role is uh, professionally you know this one refers to ourselves so what should we do as professionals so again we can't permit any professional staff to provide services or conduct any research activities that exceed the staff members certification status competence education training and experience and certainly we're not going to do anything that will compromise that staff members independent and objective uh, professional judgment we're not we're not going to allow or permit any staff member to do that that would certainly reflect poorly on them or on us uh, the next guideline here is individuals shall make use of technology and instrumentation consistent with accepted professional guidelines in their areas of practice when technology is not available an appropriate referral may be made what do you do you need to screen a kid's hearing you don't have an audiometer are you clapping behind him of course you're not you're going to refer him out to get that screening or get that evaluation uh, and again the next guideline so similar to principle one we're going to maintain uh, and ensure that all of our technology and instrumentation is in proper working order and appropriately calibrated. And our colleagues who are audiologists certainly deal with that probably a lot more than we do as SLPs. Let's move on to principle number three. This is how we deal with the public. And so we shall provide accurate information involving any aspect of the professions. So individuals shall not misrepresent their credentials, competence, education, training, experience, or scholarly contributions. So you can't pad your resume there. Individuals shall avoid engaging in conflicts of interest. And so this is a big one. And why is that? Because 
we want to make sure again that we are protecting the integrity of our profession so that when a family says hey my okay let's let's talk about this let's let's talk about a conflict of interest here let's say that your child's teacher has a child in early intervention are you going to want to treat that child? Are you going to take that referral? Now, so many of us who thrive on our personal connections, we say, of course we're going to take that child. There is no better therapist to see that child. I already love this mother and I'm going to love her child. And this, and I can give back to this family because she's doing such a great job with my child and you're going to want to do that. However, when it looks like there's a conflict of interest, when somebody else can look at it and think, eh, that's a little sticky there, that might be something that you would probably want to avoid strictly because of that appearance of that conflict there and so again it is best to avoid those kinds of situations so that you not only protect yourself but you, that you protect that family as well and in that kind of situation what if it starts going south with that family and uh, your child is in that you can imagine your child is in that lady's class and so you've got to really really think about those things and again be uh, super judicious when you're looking at all the parties and, and what their role might be the remaining points under this principle a deal with honesty and integrity and so you can't misrepresent your research or your scholarly activities your diagnostic information the services provided the results of services provided your products dispensed or the effects of products dispensed and so when you're doing something with a family that may not be a completely accepted practice that might still be experimental in nature, you have to talk about those things with families. And again, as SLPs, are we really doing a lot of that? Probably, maybe, I don't know. I, I don't know about your practice, but generally, um, our, our colleagues in OT might deal with that, whether they're thinking about listening therapy or whether they wanna recommend something that's, again, um, outside of what research is telling us is evidence-based practice, and so you have to be careful about that. Uh, the next guideline says individuals shall not defraud through intent, ignorance, negligence, or engage in any scheme to defraud in connection with obtaining payment, reimbursement, or grants and contracts for services provided, research conducted, or products dispensed. The next one talks about you shall provide accurate and complete information about the nature and management of communication disorders, about the professions, and then again, uh, professional services, products for sale, and about research and scholarly activities. So you've got to talk about what's going on with the child. And in, and in some ways, I really look at this and say, you know, when we're withholding diagnostic information from a parent because we think, oh, they're emotionally not ready for it. Oh, I don't know how they're gonna react to this. Oh, that kind of thing. You know, we really have a responsibility to share what we know and to uh, give parents uh, the full picture of what's going on with their child. And sometimes as early interventionists, uh, we don't wanna do that. We wanna stay within, uh, within kind of the realm of this is a delay I don't want to say anything that would that would alarm a family when I might be wrong those kinds of things and so again as SLPs with master's degrees uh, we usually don't have as much a problem with that as maybe our friends who are educators who would really struggle with I, I, I don't know if I should say this to a family or not and so again your code of ethics says that we should be sharing that full uh, picture and again the wording there was uh, the scope of communication disorders and so we want families to always have the best information they can have. The next guideline deals with adhering to prevailing professional norms and you can't use misrepresentations when advertising, announcing, or promoting a professional service or product or when reporting research results. And in this age of internet and marketing that may not affect a therapist who is in, say, works for a state early in early intervention program as much as it would as someone who has a, a practice who again they're doing a lot more marketing so you have to be careful about that and then individuals shall not knowingly make false financial or non-financial statements and shall complete all materials honestly and without omission and then th that was it that was it on dealing with the public so now let's go on and look at the last section in the code of ethics and this is principle four how we deal with other professions and professionals so individuals shall uphold the dignity and autonomy of the professions 
maintain collaborative and har harmonious interprofessional and intraprofessional relationships and accept the profession's self-imposed standards. And so again, this is talking about how we are going to deal with our colleagues who are in other fields in early intervention in pediatrics, as well as fellow speech language pathologists. So let's look at all these guidelines. A, individuals shall work collaboratively when appropriate with members of one's own profession and or members of other professions to deliver the highest quality of care. So we've already talked about how important that is to refer out when you're not sure what you're seeing or that, a, that you know that a family needs more that you can offer, who needs somebody else who has a different, different level of training or expertise than you do. The next one, individuals shall exercise independent professional judgment in recommending and providing professional services when an administrative mandate, referral source, or prescription prevents keeping the welfare of persons served paramount. So what does that mean? That means, again, we have to use our own judgment. And we talked about this back in the previous section when we said that we can't really always meet the demands of a supervisor or an administrator or a program director who's asking us to do things that we know aren't in the best interest of a child or family. Let's say too, it might be the doctor. Let's say the doctor just goes ahead and writes. Let's, let's say the mom says to a doctor, look, I know I can get speech twice a month with my insurance. And so the doctor says, great, I'm just going to write the script for that. But you see, you evaluate the child and you know that the child is going to need more therapy than that. And so what do you do there? Again, we have a professional obligation according to our code of ethics to say, I know the doctor wrote this script for twice a month, but here's what I'm really recommending for this child. And again, you can use your code of ethics to back you up with that situation. All right, the next guideline, guideline C here, individual statements to colleagues about professional services, research results, and products shall adhere to prevailing professional standards and shall contain no misrepresentation. So again, you're not gonna lie <laughs> about what you did or what you can do or what, what you want the results to be. You have to maintain that uh, honesty there. D in this section, individuals shall not engage in any form of conduct that adversely reflects on the professions or on the individual's fitness to serve persons professionally. And so that talks about you, your own, uh, what you're doing uh, in your own life as well as other people. We can't affect other people's ability to practice. And so that's certainly there. Uh, the next one's uh, continue to deal with honesty and integrity. So individuals shall not engage in dishonesty, negligence, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. You can't make false statements when you're filling out paperwork like applications or any disclosure materials. You've got to answer all of those things. Uh, accurately. The next sections have to deal with relationship issues. So individuals shall not engage in any form of harassment, power abuse, or sexual harassment. And then the next one uh, talks about you, you should not engage in sexual activities with individuals other than a spouse or other individual with whom a prior consensual relationship exists over whom they exercise professional authority or power, including persons receiving services, assistants, students, or research participants. So you can't have a fling with someone that you're treating or supervising. All right, the next one. Individuals shall not knowingly allow anyone under their supervision to engage in any practice that violates the code of ethics. Uh, the next one deals with credit uh, professionally, like with research and scholarly activities. So you shall assign credit only to those who have actually contributed to a publication, presentation, process, or product. And then citing your source, which as someone, again, who has a website and I read my words directly on other people's websites and there's not a mention of that. And so again, citing your source is so important. So individuals shall reference the source when using other person's ideas, research, presentations, results, or products in written, oral, or any other media presentation or summary to do otherwise constitutes plagiarism. So again, that's super, super serious. Uh, the next guideline deals 
deals with discrimination and we've already reviewed all those things so we can't discriminate in relationships on the basis of anything <laughs> we have to be super uh, consistent and objective across the board so no discrimination on the basis of race ethnic uh, ethnicity sex gender identity gender expression sexual orientation age religion national origin disability culture language dialect or socioeconomic status the remaining principles here deal with reporting ethical violations, which we've already talked about a little bit. And so individuals with evidence that the code of ethics may have been violated have the responsibility to work collaboratively to resolve the situation where possible or to inform the Board of Ethics through its established procedures. So do you have to report somebody immediately? No, it talks about resolving the situation where possible and again, getting to that best solution for everyone involved. Uh, we're gonna keep going on this same uh, venue here with reporting. So individuals shall report members of other professions who they know have violated standards of care to the appropriate professional licensing authority or board other professional regulatory body or professional association when such violation compromises the welfare of persons served and or research participants. So if you know of other violations, report them. Uh, way back at the beginning of my career when I kind of was in a dual position where I worked in geriatrics and in pediatrics, certainly we would see things uh, in nursing homes or with with other professions that would again really really questionable things going on and so sometimes you think who's who's got jurisdiction over this who 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 can i tell who can i talk to you about this to make this better for again the organization the clients the families what, whatever's going on there sometimes we do need to look outside our profession and think who who would be the the governing body that i should uh, discuss this situation with uh, the next one deals with using the reporting system as a personal vendetta. So individuals shall not file or encourage others to file complaints that disregard or ignore facts that would disprove the allegation. The code of ethics shall not be used for personal uh, reprisal as a means of addressing personal animosity or as a vehicle for retaliation. So no revenge reporting here. All right, the last ones deal with compliance. And so individuals making and responding to complaints shall comply fully with the policies of the Board of Ethics. So you're basically saying, hey, I know the rules when I'm going in and I'm going to participate if there's any investigation or anything that would be going on. Uh, the next one says individuals involved in ethics complaint shall not knowingly make false statements or withhold relevant facts necessary to uh, fairly resolve the complaints and then um, compliance always deals with the law so individuals shall comply with local state and federal laws and regulations applicable to professional practice research ethics and the responsible conduct of research and so then the self-reporting piece comes in we have to self-report convictions when you're guilty or when there's a no contest plea for crimes. And again, this sounds really serious, but the rules are there. So when an individual has been convicted, found guilty, or entered a plea of guilty, and you're not going to uh, object to that. So you have to report any misdemeanor involving dishonesty or physical harm or threat of physical harm to the person or property of another, or certainly any felony. You have 30 days to do that. Uh, and you have to send that into ASHA so that you can be compliant with that self-reporting uh, statute there. So, and again, this also deals not only with what we talked about with legal behavior, but certainly professional behavior. So individuals who've been publicly sanctioned or denied a license or a professional credential by any professional association, professional licensing authority or board, or other professional regulatory body shall self-report by notifying ASHA Standards and Ethics Board in writing within 30 30 days of the final action or disposition. And so you have to, again, that's self-reporting. All right, so that is a lot of information, but it is there to protect you. And again, I think sometimes it's so, we think about this information as being so boring or so repetitive or mundane, but we have to know what's in there, again, so that we can uh, protect ourselves. And you may not have done that in a long time. You may not have ever really read that code of ethics. So we did that today. 
And um, I'm, I'm, I hope that you, again, as we read through that, it's it's not as exciting as other podcasts and certainly not as other, maybe even other courses on ethics. The next ethics course that I'm going to teach, we're going to do a lot of case studies. But this is important to really review the foundational pieces so that you understand what's in that code of ethics. And then we can use that kind of as a launching pad when we talk about these real life situations that we all face. Uh, and, and again, we talked about it's not just with the families that we serve, all of that's important, but sometimes it's just this interprofessional with uh, relationships. So us with other disciplines, maybe team members that we serve with, sometimes it's with other SLPs and certainly within our organizations, we have things that come up like this. And so understanding the code of ethics, knowing what's there, knowing again, beyond what's legal, what would be ethical. So not what I, I can't do, but what should I do? What can I do in this situation? And again, I think when we're looking at ethical behavior, if we're always thinking, what is right? What will benefit this child and this family? And we know that we should always strive to err uh, and be on that side. So, okay, so I want to end with a quote from a speech language pathologist who uh, did a nice paper. You can find this reference in the references if you get the CE credit for the show in the handout. Uh, her name is Teresa Rogers and she says, Ethics transcends all professionals, practice settings, and types of clients. Ethical principles, codes of ethics, and ethical decision-making processes are pervasive to our work as SLPs. It's imperative then that we are well equipped to not only recognize ethical dilemmas, but that we have the knowledge and expertise to resolve them confidently. And so I hope that the information that we've covered in this course will help you do that. So that's it for this course, Ethics for the SLP. And our next ethics course that I've already mentioned, and again, we usually have to have two hours of ethics courses, so I hope that you'll join me for that course. We're going to review a few ethical decision-making models and then do some case studies together where we take the information, like we said in, in this show, and then we really discuss it. So if you've only done one of your ethics courses so far and you're looking for another one, I hope that you'll join me for that. Now, if you have not purchased your CE credit for this course yet, that link is below. It'll take you to my website, which is Teach Me to Talk. While you're there, I hope that you'll check out our entire CE program. We have over 75 different continuing education courses for all therapists. Most of them are $5. And so again, a really reasonable way to get your continuing education credits done. Um, you'll get a certificate of completion generated the same day. You can make an account at our website so that you can go back and pull all your handouts and you've got your record there so that you can see where you are with your your hours accumulation as you're working through that process. If you are a speech language pathologist, we will file your ASHA credit and lots of companies don't do that anymore. So we are so happy to be able to continue to do that. So again, I hope that you'll check that out. And again, if this is your first time doing one of my courses, welcome. I hope that you'll stay and do some more. And again, you can look at all that information at Teach Me to Talk. All right, that's it for today's course. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and thank you so much for joining me for Teach Me to Talks podcast. Thank you.